I rolled slowly down the hall of Stable 29, my thoughts filled with shadows and regrets and pain. I'd failed Steelhooves. He was dead. And I had failed him. He'd only asked one thing of me in return. He'd asked me to save just one pony. But I had left Star Sparkle in Canterlot. And now, she was dead. I wonder if the Enclave even knew that they had wiped out a village of ponies. If that had bothered to if they had bothered to check before they had started their attack. If they even cared. I reached the end of the hall and looked up toward the lit banner above the door. Vinyl scratch. I lifted a hoof and clopped it against the door. Velvet? A voice drifted out from inside. I want to be alone. Velvet, please. I knew she was taking the loss of Steelhoof's hard, but I began to worry when Calamity had told me she'd locked herself in Vinyl Scratch's room. It's time for us to go. I said I want to be alone, she shouted from behind the door, making me flinch. Velvet? Something was wrong, even more wrong than I knew. Please, talk to me. I heard the door unlock. The metal slid away with a pneumatic hiss. Velvet was standing there, looking wrecked, a cross expression on her face. Her horn was glowing. You don't want to talk to me right now, little pip. Now go. I focused, beginning to roll inside. She telekinetically threw something at me, hitting me in the chest. I looked down at the object, which had bounced off me and fallen into my lap. It was a box of memory orbs. Steelhoof's memory orbs. You knew, Velvet said firmly, but surprisingly without accu accusation. Calamity told me that much, but I didn't realize Steelhoof's knew too. All of you did. Oh, goddesses. She just looked at his memories. She'd been, she'd seen him die on the battlefield that day. Fluttershy had tested the mega spells. Velvet, I began, only to find there was nothing I could possibly say other than I'm sorry. Just go. I choked. I... I was trying... I should have... Told me? She questioned, a pained smirk crossing her face. I knew why you didn't. You were trying to spare me the truth. Trying to save me. And others, I suspect. That's what you do, isn't it? There was something in her voice I deeply disliked. But... I had been fearing this day for weeks. Sure that the truth about Fluttershy's role in the end of things would devastate Velvet Remedy. But I was expecting rage, screaming, not this. Fluttershy, she made a mistake, I offered, wanting to tell Velvet that the Mega Spell bombs weren't really Fluttershy's fault, that all the death and destruction shouldn't be laid on her idol's hooves. It was okay to still love Fluttershy. She created... Fluttershy created something beautiful, Velvet Remedy interjected sternly, bucking no room for argument. The only mistake she made was to give it to any pony. That? Well, I should be relieved to hear her say that, right? So why wasn't I? Now, if you'll excuse me, I want to be alone, she said gravely. I don't think I can travel with you anymore. What? I breathed. My wounded heart breaking. I couldn't lose another friend. Not now. Wh why? Loud Remedy huffed, becoming truly cross. You really want to leave, little Pip. Before I say something, we'll both regret. She began to walk away, trying to close the door behind her. I refused to shut, sensing that I was in the way. But... The remedy spun, stomping. Fluttershy's mistake was giving the mega spells to other ponies. She'd created magics of life and healing. How could I not love her for that? She glared. Or it was beyond naive to think she could give mega spells to anyone without them being turned into something horrible. I fought to respond, but my brain wasn't working. I felt paralyzed as I watched one of my dearest friends seem to self-destruct. Oh. I understand why she thought other ponies would use the spells for good. I've just been as stupid. I've spent my life wanting to help ponies, 
because I've held to this idiotic, naive belief that deep inside we are inherently good, that we deserve to be helped, to be saved. Her words were giving me an unpleasant flashback to Mr. Topaz. We, we are basically good. Bill Remedy laughed, a broken, nasty laugh. Haven't you been paying attention, little Pip? She scolded. Did you somehow miss our brew? About Fluttershy's Cottage? Or about every other damn thing we've seen? She shook her head. Deep inside, we're all raiders. My muzzle hung open. No, that's not true. I knew Velvet Remedy was hurting. I prayed this was her uh, pain speaking. I couldn't bear seeing her like this. No, she countered. Even the best of us fall to evil at the drop of a hat. Do you know what the worst thing I've ever done in my life was? I suspected she was about to bring up killing the raiders in Fluttershy's home. But she surprised me. It was when I tried to make you... Uh, tried to make... Tried to use you to make Calamity jealous. I knew you loved me, and I... She lowered her head. It was horrible. What I tried to do was cruel and unkind. I don't deserve forgiveness. I wanted to reach out and hug her, to hold her. But I forgave you, I told her softly. We all have moments of evil, she interrupted. That's the point, little Pip. Hell, you're probably the most selfless, noble pony in all the wasteland. And look at what you've done. We're here attending Steelhu's funeral because you decided to set off a mega spell in their den. I reeled as if she had bucked me. Honestly, I know you just think of them as monsters, and I even know why you had to do it. The goddess was a threat to everyone and everything, but you blew up their home to get at her, little pip. Oh, goddesses. You massacred all those monsters' families with their little monster children. Her tone was sad and without malice, but each word slammed into me with the force of a sledgehammer. Honestly, what did you expect them to do? Roll over? Play dead? She looked directly into my eyes. She lives is dead because of what you did. My whole body went numb. And the worst part is that it was the right thing to do. All of this. See who's death. It was my fault. And you are the best of us. She reached up, pushing me out of the door with a hoof. I'm not coming with you, little Pip. I can't help save the wasteland if I can't believe the ponies in it are worth saving. The metal door slid shut behind us. I fell out of my wheelchair and curled up on the floor, hurting beyond the telling of it. Finally, the tears came, and they wouldn't stop. Calamity came looking for me. I didn't want to move. I wanted to just die. I... I did this, I moaned, unable to cry anymore. Now you stop that right now, you hear? Calamity ordered. You risked your own life, and nearly lost it, saving the equestrian wasteland, from one of the biggest threats I could imagine. You're a big damn hero, and I won't stand for none of this self-pity. That bomb killed... how many? Hellhounds? Pegasi? How many unintended dead? Just to take out the goddess. I never imagined... I even imagined that Red Eye would be appalled at how I had discarded my morals. Why I see it, you saved every pony, Calamity told me. And it weren't your fault the damn Enclave showed up when they did. No pony could have predicted that. How about the Hellhounds? Clemity nickered. Ah, damn it, Velvet. He stomped. The Hellhounds are nothing but murderers, territorial monsters, who kill ponies indiscriminately. They have been for centuries. You all saved countless lives by wiping out so many of them. He was right. But that didn't stop me from thinking of magical dragon's fire burning away monster families filled with helpless, screaming children. Let's go get your whale, little pip. I blinked, looking at him. You're coming with me? 
I was actually surprised that the Pegasus nodded. I want to stay with Velvet. Be here for her, Calamity told me, fluffing his wings in his discomfort. But you need to get to Manhattan, and it ain't safe for you to travel alone. A sick heroine and a ghoul merchant? He shook his head. She'll be hurting something fierce. But if I don't come along, I reckon you might not make it. And I ain't aiming to lose any more friends this week. Manhattan. Homage. My heart was bleeding out. I needed her, so badly. But the idea of seeing her again filled me with dread. How could she possibly want anything to do with me after what I've done? After what I've become? He leaned down and gave me a nuzzle. Especially not my first one. I felt a brush of warmth against my bleak, dying heart. Thank you. I... I'm sorry for pulling you away from her. From what I gather, y'all have given her more help than I could. If there's any way out of the darkness she's in right now, those little statue thingies are the best gods she could hope for. Sometimes, my Pegasus friend was startlingly wise. Clemony and I huddled together in the back of the delivery wagon, clad in anti-radiation barding. Our ghoul friend had smiled broadly as she produced the second suit from the back of the wagon. This one tailored for a Pegasus stallion. I was beginning to think Ditsy Doo really did carry absolutely everything we might need. Calamity had stopped or strapped his battle saddle over the anti-radiation barding, foregoing his normal armor. Even with the barding, we were having to consume right away at least once every hour. Calamity didn't have to be in there with me, but he insisted. I was both thankful and annoyed with him for it. Clemente didn't want to risk taking the Sky Bandit into Manhattan. Crosswords had confirmed reports that a lot of the Enclave operating within the city. So, we would either have to go on on Hoof or in Ditsy Doo's wagon. The trip shouldn't take more than a few hours. We were going to stop at Ten Pony Tower first, drop me off. Then Calamity was going to go with Ditsy Doo to Friendship City. If Homage would still have me, I hope to spend a week wrapped in her embrace. Ah, pony feathers, Calamity said, looking up from our fourteenth game. Best of thirty-nine? I was beginning to suspect he was letting me win. Really, no pony could be this bad at tic-tac-toe. I felt the wagon slow. Ah, hell, Calamity spat as two enclave pegasi shot past the wagon and yawed, circling back towards us. Halt, Pegasus, one of them called out, her armor magnifying her voice and altering it with an intimidating reverb. Identif, great leaders, what the hell is that thing? Not good. Trish, trish. They're shooting at us? I gasped. The two enclave Pegasi had opened fire on Ditsy Doo. The wagon went into an abrupt dive. Clamming and I tumbled against the wall of the wagon, along with several crates. One containing dozens of right-away packets, spilled open, scattering glowing orange packets. Several fell through the window that looked out the front of the wagon. I pulled myself to the window and peeked out of the wagon as it began to pull up, twisting as Ditsy Doo made a hard turn, weaving through the piers of the Luna Line. Smoke curled off a hole in her head, or her lead barding, just behind her left wing, glowing ichor seeping through her flesh wound. Zoop. Whatever. Above me, part of the roof glowed, a hole the size of a foal disintegrating away. I floated out a little Macintosh, pushing myself onto a toppled crate until I could see one of the attacking Pegasi through the opening. I slid into Sats. Clamity launched himself out of the back of the wagon, taking wing as I fired several shots into the black carapace of the Enclave soldier. Two of the bullets glanced off the armor, but the third penetrated. I ducked down, needing to reload with either armor-piercing or magical bullets. The wagon shifted again, all the crates sliding towards the open rear as Ditsy Doo tried to gain altitude. I cast out a levitation net, trying to keep Ditsy Doo from losing all the wares she was carrying. A bolt of magical energy flew into the wagon, striking one of the metal boxes 
and melting it, destroying whatever had been inside. I could hear Calamity's battle saddle firing. Dead shot, Calamity. I was sure he hit his mark. One of the Enclave Pegasi was swooping in right behind us. The gems in her battle saddle crackled, glowing brighter as the Pegasus switched to more powerfully charged spark packs. I looked at a little Macintosh. My targeting spell allowed me to lock on to the Pegasus's head. I hadn't had time to swip, swap bullets, but if I could hit the visor, I was sure my shot would go through. I was thrown back violently as Ditsy Doo suddenly came to a complete stop. The chasing Pegasi tried to pull up, but slammed jarringly into the back of the wagon's roof. We started moving again, and the black carapace-clad Pegasi dropped to the ground, unconscious. I was cleaning up the crates, levitating them into order when Calamity flew back. Sorry, little pip, but I couldn't bring myself to kill the fellow, he said, his muzzle etched into a grimace. I grounded him with a shot through the wing, but they're likely to have more trouble from that lot. He looked away. I used to be one of those soldiers. I understood. Do you want to talk about it? Clemente shook his head. Not right yet. Let's get you better first, he said, looking for me. But yeah, I reckon I'm going to have to talk about this, or sooner than later. Oh, it just keeps getting better, I groaned, as we spotted the Enclave Array on the top of Ten Pony Tower. Ditsy Doo veered away, looking for a safe place to land, some place out of sight. We would have to approach Ten Pony Tower on hoof, or more precisely, I would. The Enclave presence in Ten Pony meant that it was no place for either of my Pegasus friends. A memory resurfaced. Open it back up, Ambrosa had yelled, ordering me as the antenna-like weapons on her battle saddle had glowed threateningly. You open this room right now, or I swear by the council, I'll teach you what it's like to melt. I can't, I had tried to reason with her. I'm as trapped as you are. This room can only be opened from outside. And, based on the videos I saw on my first trip to Mary Pony, only by the goddess. That was all. Just a flash. A fragment of those thirty-plus minutes I was missing. Ditsy Doo landed in the darkened, darkened mouth of a crumbling chariot, chariot wash. She unhitched herself from the wagon, digging a healing potion out of the mailbag slung by her side. Ditsy Doo? Calamity? Would you wait for me here? I asked plaintively. Just a few hours, in case I can't get in, or something goes wrong, in case Homage kicks me out. Ditsy Doo nodded swiftly, then dropped her chalkboard and wrote a single word. Muffins? I smiled. If I can get Homage to bake some, absolutely. A few minutes later, I was walking through the rubble towards Ten Pony Tower. The building seemed more, or so much more imposing from street level. It towered upwards, the only truly intact building anywhere close to its size, rising out of the graveyard of Manhattan like a lighthouse serving as both beacon and warning. My hooves trod between the emptied cans of food, old campfires, and a dozen old other reminders that part of Red Eye's army had been camped around the tower, cutting out from the rest of the Equestrian Wasteland, threatening to destroy it with a balefire bomb. The balefire bomb I had talked Red Eye into sending to Splendid Valley, so I could use it to kill the goddess and destroy the Black Book, and kill countless others, including Steel Hooves, in the act of it. The thought clawed at my heart. The little pony in my head wept quietly. I stopped, leaning against a giant S, one of the more intact letters which had come crashing down from the face of the building. I wasn't breathing right. I wanted to collapse again. I couldn't tell if it was from the sorrow threatening to overwhelm me, or the weakness that wrecked my body. They felt like one and the same. Ahead, I saw the main entrance to Tempony Tower that had been armored over. The whole lower floors were barricaded with a yard of magically fused rubble. The only way in, other than the roof, was through the four-star station above me. I had known this, of course, but it didn't make the idea of levitating up to the station any less exhausting. I looked upwards and saw the black, insectoid form of an armored enclave soldier 
strutting across one of the tracks above me. With a flick of my hoof, I turned on the MG Stealth Buck 2 and became invisible. What do you mean she's not here? I cried as I followed Life Bloom. Life Bloom led me through the secret parts of Tempony Tower, places that neither the citizens of the tower nor its new, armored clad guests knew of. Just that, little pip, Life Bloom affirmed. The Enclave shut down a broadcast. Apparently, they have the ability to override whatever any of the rest of us are doing with those towers. But it will still be my project, right? Rainbow Dash had asked. It will still be the Ministry of Awesome. The Enclave didn't control the central hub for the single Pegasus project, but they controlled who knew how many Ministry of Awesome hubs above the clouds. And Rainbow Dash had assured that the Ministry of Awesome had overriding authority. I knew my homage. She wouldn't stand for being shut down. She would see the truth, see that the truth got out if it killed her. When did she leave? I asked, worried more for her now than I had been when Ten Pony Tower was facing Red Eyes Bomb. That, at least, I had been in a position to prevent. Yesterday morning, just a few hours after they took control of the airwaves, Life Bloom told me as we reached the chamber where he would plunge or purge the taint still trapped in my body. She took a bunch of those override devices, like the one she gave you for the Philadelphia Tower. Said she had an idea. You go homage, I whispered, wanted to cheer for her despite my worries and fears. Ditsidu's hooves touched down on the docks of Friendship Island. Oddly not being able to approach Friendship City without being shot at, ain't it? Clemente called to me as he hopped out of the back of the wagon. Yep, I said, mimicking his accent decently. He chuckled. Ditsidu detached from the wagon and shook herself, the lead-lined cloak fluttering. She had been disappointed but understanding at the lack of muffins. Clemente had been concerned but my stay at Tempony Tower had proved to be short-lived. But without homage, and with Pegasi in black carapace-like armor walking through the public areas of the Ritzy building, I had found myself without reason or desire to stay. Watching a couple armored Enclave ponies looking through the window of my locked-up former cheese shop as they chatted about how they should require hero discounts was the final buck that drove me back outside. A guard pony was approaching us, her eyes shifting between the two pegasi. So, is this a visit from the great and benevolent Enclave, is it? Clemity coughed and stomped a bit. Not hardly. Really? The guard asked, moving closer. Let me see your flank. I raised an eyebrow at that, but Clemity turned, taking the anti-radiation barding in his teeth and pulling it over his flank revealing the scar in the shape of the cloud and lightning bolt that had destroyed his cutie mark. All right, then, the guard mare said, relaxing visibly. Welcome to Friendship City. She gave us a pleasant smile, her eyes scanning over the wagon, then at Ditsy Doo, widening in surprise. Ditsy? The Wasteland Survival Guide, Ditsy? Ditsy Doo gave a happy clop at the recognition. DJ Pwn 3 said you were a ghoul, but she never said you were a glowing one. Ditsy Doo set down her chalkboard and wrote on it before kicking it over to the guard. Glow is new. Too much splendid valley. Friendship City can fix? The guard read the chalkboard and looked uncertain, but hopeful. Well, if there's any pony who could be help, it would be Dr. Freshwater. She's in charge of the science station built into Friendship Island. She created the water purifiers about a decade back and has spent a few years working on unlocking the mysteries of what she calls the Children of the Bombs. Cheery, I thought aloud, suspecting that I might very well fit into that category. Life Bloom had magically purged me of taint. I had been exposed to a lot of it, both through direct contact with the dirty MIP Lake in Mariponi, and later in trace aerosol amounts from the leak in the safe room. According to Life Bloom, all of my internal organs were in the right places, and I hadn't started to change size or grow wings. But the taint had altered me on a fundamentally biological level. According to the unicorn, 
I was closer to being an alicorn than a pony. I did not consider this a good thing. The goddess claimed that the alicorns were improved and superior, better suited than ponies to survive and thrive in the new world, and their natural successors. I just felt a stranger in my own skin. The guard gave me a look. And anything I can help you with, friend? I thought a moment. We heard help Ditsy do, and we'll be staying as long as that takes. Can you give us a quick picture of Friendship City? The guard nodded. You bet I can. The basic rundown was this. Friendship City tries to be a good place for these opponents to live, as with as much freedom and safety as we can offer. The island makes that pretty easy. We don't get much trouble from raiders or slavers out here, usually just the occasional sea serpent or rat gator. We occasionally get refugees or folk looking to settle down. We do the best we can for them, although we're beginning to become a town that's running out of room. Raspberry Tart wants to start building shacks around the base of the main city, but Mayor Black Seas is impeding the expansion. She doesn't want Friendship Island becoming a shantytown. I nodded, taking mental notes. Friendship City is run by a council of three august ponies. <clears throat> Dr. Freshwater, who I already told you heads the science station, Mayor Black Seas, who speaks for the general citizenry, and Chief Lantern, who is head of the guard. If you're looking for temporary housing, your best bet is the Warm Smiles Inn. You can also seek refuge in the common room for free, but I don't recommend it. The guard scowled. The place is run by Raspberry Tart. Mayor says she runs things crooked. Don't know about that. But I do know she takes advantage of the lack of supervision she has fostered around that place. The city bristled and neighed, stomping a hoof. At my questioning look, she trotted over and recovered a chalkboard, erasing it with her hoof and writing, RT does bad business. No muffins for her. The guard began to lead us around the science station entrance, which backdoored into the docks. Despite the city's name, the entrance looked anything but friendly. Thick armor slabs operating, operated by pneumatic sealed, seals, the science station with magically armored shielded turrets covering the approach. There was no lock and no terminal, just a camera. The door could only be operated by some pony inside. A little green mat of phlox grass and white flowers lay in the front of the door, saying, Welcome. Raspberry Tart is the head of the Merchants' Union. Mayor Blacksees says she's building a case to get her thrown out of the city. But the others won't act unless they have proof, for fear that she'll take too many of the merchants with her. The guard rolled her eyes. That is, assuming she could even get out the front door. The guard waved a hoof at the camera, smiling. I heard the turrets power down and the thick slabs slide open with a deep throated hiss. Now I'm afraid you will have to turn in your weapons at the door, the guard mayor cautioned. Friendship City is a friendly place, and we want to keep it that way. You'll get them back once you leave, but I recommend you take a moment to introduce yourselves to Mayor Blacksea's as soon as you get it to do settled in. You'll find her in Blacksea's supplies. Then she smiled at Calamity. And I imagine you will want to be paying a visit to Radar, a resident Dashite. Calamity gasped in dumbfounded surprise. Radar's still alive? He gasped. And he's here? Yes, indeed. Ancient as dirt, but still flapping his wings. He was in charge of the science station back when Friendship City was founded. He turned the city into the place it is. I blinked, suddenly remembering a chapter from the Wasteland Survival Guide on the founding of some city somewhere. I had only skimmed the chapter at the time I read the book. After all, I had been more interested in basic survival tips than the grandiose concept of settlement building and I had remembered Calamity's assertion that a pegasus had helped string up the rope bridges connecting the freestanding sections of Friendship Bridge. The guard grinned in Calamity's expression. I take it you weren't really expecting to see another Dashite in your lifetime. I giggled at my companion. I want to pick up your jaw before you come in. 
Calamity was turning his battle saddle in at the guard station, just inside, when a water blue unicorn with a short stalk of raspberry mane and a matching short tail trotted up with a sense of urgency. Dressed in her lab coat, she looked very scientific. Hello, everypony. Welcome to the Friendship City Science Station, where we are making a better tomorrow for all pony kind. Please, please come in, she encouraged. I'm Dr. Freshwater. This is my facility. Please make yourselves at home. Don't touch anything. She shook my hoof, then spun immediately to Ditsy. Ditsy do, is it? Dr. Freshwater asked, floating out a pair of glasses and trotting over to get a closer look at her glowing ghoul pegasus. She floated out a small device that began to clickety-click, just like the radiation sensor on my pit buck. Ditsy do nodded, apparently at ease with the abrupt invasion of personal space. Let's quickly get you to the radiation testing chamber, shall we? My, your output is impressive. And this is a new condition? When did you become like this? Where did you get such exposure? No, no, don't stop to write anything, just come along. The doctor was already trotting away, motioning with her tail for Ditsy Doo to follow. Let's get you all hooked up. Ditsy Doo glanced back over her wings, giving us a look that I couldn't interpret because her eyes were doing that weird thing of hers again. Then she fluttered off after an impatient Dr. Freshwater, who seemed eager to poke and prod her in the name of science. She'll be alright, won't she? I asked passing lab pony. Oh, yeah, sure, the pony drawled. Once she's got the glowing one strapped in, she'll stay on the safe side of the glass. I meant Ditsy do, I said crossly at the lab pony as they ambled away. I'm sure she'll be fine, Clamity assured me, as he flew up next to me, battle saddle free. Dr. Freshwater seemed a bit odd, sure, but if she can help Ditsy get back to Silver Bell any faster, I'm sure the old mare will be happy to put up the, the tests. I shuddered, disliking the idea. This was why we were here, why Ditsy had come, but that didn't make me feel comfortable with it. I hope they did right by her. Zebra potions, the elderly Pegasus insisted proudly, when Calamity rather bluntly asked about his longevity. Radar thumped a uh, <clears throat> sienna hoof against his chest, wincing slightly, and exclaimed, Ain't nothing better. Them stripers have unlocked all manner of secrets with their bruise. You'd be amazed. Actually, I can believe it, I told the wrinkled old sienna pony, whose close-cropped mane might have been white even before the turn of the century. I chuckled, I and Calamity, who looked caught between an urge to dash and a desire to break into squeeze of oh my gosh. It was a reunion he had never expected with a pony he had never known, but the mere idea that he wasn't the only dashite in the question wasteland seemed to have overwhelmed him. The damned upstart young Freshwater may have su surpassed my position on the city council, even taken over my place as head researcher, but she can't force me to retire, not while there's plenty of life in mind in me, Radar insisted. I'm as fit as I ever was. To prove it, the old Pegasus stretched out his wings and flew halfway across his loft in the back of the science station. He made it three full yards before having to land, wheezing frightfully. Whoa there! Calamity said. The spell he seemed to be under breaking. He flew up to the wobbled old Pegasus, trying uh, to steady him, but Raider pushed the younger Dashite away. I said I was fit. Don't need no help. He looked between us. Now, who are your folk, and what can an old Radar do for you? I'm Calamity, my friend said warmingly. And this is my best friend, Lil Pip. I'm a Dashite, down from the clouds about seven years now. I thought I was the only one around. I mean, I heard stories of you, and but you left the enclave so long ago. And now they've come back, Radar pointed out. Hell of a bad bit of timing. Calamity nodded morsefully. Radar looked Calamity up and down. Tell me, what drew you? you think you're here for? I don't know, Calamity admitted. 
but I don't think they're here to save the equestrian wasteland. The elderly Pegasus smirked. Ah, so you don't buy the horse apples they're shoving over the radio, none either. Clement shook his head. Good buck. I was beginning to think it was just me. And you, what's your name? Radar turned to me. How about you, youngin? You think they come down from the big old sky to save your tail? Little Pip, I reminded him. And no. No, I definitely don't. Radar smiled, nodding sagely. Well, the way I see it, it's got to do with the Sustainable Pegasus Project. That's the key to the Enclave's power. How so? I asked. Agriculture, you silly corn, Radar stated. Without the towers, the Enclave can't feed ponies. The Pegasus wouldn't be able to survive cut off from the Cloud Curtain. Remember when you asked about what we ate up here, and I joked about cloud seeding, Clementy had told us, referring to a conversation we had the morning after the Pinky Bell Farm. I don't know what them towers were originally meant to do, but I know what the Enclave has repurposed them to do, and that's to enchant the clouds for miles around them so we can go crops right up in the sky. Without that, Radar insisted, the Enclave falls. Red Eye plans to take control of the SPP. He wants to control the weather. Radar scoffed, muttering under his breath. Good luck with that. I remember what Calamity had said back in Spike's cave. Only time they can act as one is when they're feeling threatened. Then, from their perspective, Radar surmised, it's him or them. Luna's shuddering mon mooncake quakes, I cursed, getting a raised eyebrow from the elderly Pegasus and a whisper. She does this a lot from Calamity. We could have seen this coming. I looked at Calamity in sullen weariness. When we first learned that Red Eye was messing with the Philadelphia Tower, we could have at least guessed the Enclave would be stepping in sooner or later. By the time we had left Canterlot, we should have known for sure. I bit my lower lip. It was only a matter of time. The moment they cottoned onto Red Eye's plan. And like the Enclave had been paying the Equestrian Wasteland all that much attention, Calamity told me. At least, never seemed like they did to me. A few scouting parties every year. Wait! Radar suddenly flew up to me, his snout pressing against mine. You said your name was Lil Pip? Y yes I stammered, taken aback. You ever been to the Ministry of Awesome? Before the grand and mighty enclave tore all Canalon down the mountain? I watched the monitor as Red Eye, or Red, Radar keyed up the sequence. Y'all have been to the Ministry of Awesome? Clement asked Radar, unable to conceal his shock. Yeah, I was, Radar replied. It was decades ago, not long after they burned my cutie mark off me. I was hoping to find answers. He looked at us as the monitor came to life, showing first static, then a scene of the MAW basement, the shield de uh, dominating the center. I didn't get no further than the security station, and I zoomed out of there, leaving the whole damn place on high alert behind me. But I did manage to snatch up this little gem from the security logs. I watched the monitor. The timestamp of the log was very old. A few years post-apocalypse. What do you mean, good luck with that? I asked, as I watched the minutes tick by on the recording. What now? When I said right I was planning to take over the SPP, I reminded him. You said, good luck with that. Radar made a sound of understanding. Well... The whole damn enclave has been trying to get the central hub for generations now. If they can't do it, I don't see how Red Eye has a chance. He's got a plan, I said confidently. Does he now? Radar scoffed. Well, I'd love to hear it, because that place is locked up tighter than my ex-wife's anus. Oh, goddesses. How I did not need the images that conjured. 
place has the best defenses Equestria could build. Has a super shield around it so powerful, nothing's been able to penetrate it. Suppose it has super guns too, but they're all inside the shield, and that shield is so overly designed that they're pretty much useless. I know the Enclave has a whole base built around it, Calamity added. Whole mess of troops to guard a place no opponent can get into. Radar chuckled, grinning at Calamity. Never found any pony who could get through. Enclave Hot Council figures the shield's keyed only to Rainbow Dash herself. And Dash had no surviving kin. So when she left, she pretty much screwed up the powers that were ought to be their prize. But they took that well, Calamity grinned. Deemed her a traitor, what they did, Radar spat. Sent Griffin Merch to kill her and bring back her head. Hoped some pony wearing Rainbow Dash around their neck might be able to walk through. Calamity and I gasped in horror. I turned to the monitor. The Enclave wanted... That's... Goddesses. Radar agreed grimly, correcting me at one point. Well, they weren't exactly the Enclave yet, but they were getting there right quick. What happened? Radar stated simply, Well, either they ain't never got her head, or they did, and it didn't work. Pinkie Pie? Rainbow Dash's voice floated up from the monitor. I shifted back to see the rather bedraggled Cyan Pegasus walking into the basement. The security camera zoomed in, following her. You here? Pinkie Pie? She tried again, sounding so small in the vast room. I brought them, just like you asked. What's this about? Her words echoed off the walls. The light of hope in her wide eyes slowly diminished. Rainbow Dash stopped a few yards in front of the shield, the magical light painting shadows across her features as she looked around. You weren't kidding about the health potions, by the way. I'm down to my last one, and I still need to make it out of that pink stew outside. That stuff's... awful. The room remained still and silent. The light in her eyes went out entirely, her expression becoming painfully sad. You're not here, are you? Rainbow Dash asked the emptiness around her. I guess that means you didn't make it either. Rainbow Dash stepped solemnly through the shield. And she walked up to the little pedestal sitting in its center, and the memory orb box resting upon it, its lid slightly ajar. Rainbow Dash nudged it open with her nose, revealing three memory orbs and spaces for three more. The second, third, and fifth were missing. I don't know what you need these for, or who this little pip you mentioned in your note is, but I hope it's as important as you said it is. Rainbow Dash frowned, her voice soft and sad. She reached into her saddlebags and pulled her memory orb out with her teeth, gently setting it in the spot reserved for the blood of butterfly orb. It wasn't easy getting these things, especially with Guild on my tail. But even she isn't brave enough to follow me into what's become of Canterlot, much less my own ministry. She put the star orb into its resting place. But she's waiting for me out there, and after that pink crap, I'm not sure I can take her. Rainbow Dash fished for the final memory orb, the one to be placed in the holder with her own cutie mark. She paused, staring at the little emblem of the cloud and his rainbow lightning bolt, then sighed and put the orb into its place. Rainbow Dash shifted her attention to the orb in the fourth holder, the balloon orb. But I trust you. You know that. You said this was very important, and I believe you. And I wouldn't leave my friend hanging. Even... Even after she was. The last word was barely a whisper. Gone. A single tear tread down her cheek, as she tried to give a weary smirk. One last prank, right? Together, as always. She lifted a hoof and pressed the orb box closed. The click of the lock, loud, in the sculpture room. I reached out and touched the monitor screen, tears welling in my own eyes. Rainbow Dash turned and started to walk away. 
As she reached the inside of the shield, she stopped. Her face screwed up with determination. But you know what, Pinky? Since you're not here, I'm changing the rules. Rainbow Dash spun around and trotted over to the mainframe on the far side of the shielded area. If some pony comes poking around in here, I want to know. I'm setting an alarm to go off in every Ministry of Awesome Hub. If I'm still alive, I want to meet this little pip of yours. Dash paused. Sorry, Pinks, she said, looking back over her shoulder. I hope you don't mind. I watched the rest of the recording in stunned, comprehending silence. Friendship City rose above us. <clears throat> Concentric rings of stone and homes, connected by walkways and platforms that spun out from a central spiraling staircase, ascending through the chimney-like open space like a plume of smoke rising to the head of the Pony of Friendship. Crowds of ponies moved up and down the spiral stairs, diverted into the catwalks and merging with the traffic that surrounded the layers of scavenged material structures built into the interior walls of the massive statue. A city built from junk, a fair portion of it pulled from ships which had sunk in the harbor. A small forest of support beams further congested the lower levels. Ponies gathered around the watering hole called Sparkles, run by a friendly yet slightly frazzled mare with a cutie mark of a sparkle cola on her flank. Her assistants moved between tables nearby, taking orders and delivering <coughs> homogenous deep-fried foodstuffs. From a radio nearby blared the sound of heavy horns, marching drums, and rumbling thunder. Enclave music. Pony stopped to stare at us as Clamity and I walked through Friendship City. Conversations died on unfinished sentences. For once, their gazes weren't oppressing me. It was the presence of the Pegasus in their mists that snatched their attention. Invariably, their eyes would quickly search out Calamity's flanks. We no longer wore the anti-radiation barding, having left it with one of Dr. Freshwater's more amiable assistants. Without barding or battle saddle, Calamity looked strangely naked beneath his desperado hat. At the sight of Calamity's dash eye brand, nervous faces broke into smiles. We were soon mobbed by strangers wherever we went, all offering friendship greetings to my Pegasus friend, and his little mare companion. I seemed I had garnered no attention at all until two Friendship City security guards approached, wearing heavy barding in cheery pastel colors that closely matched their manes. Welcome to Friendship City, Calamity. One of them smiled, offering a hoof. Word of our visit had spread faster than the crowds had allowed us to travel. And you must be the stable dweller that DJ Pwn3 keeps cheering. It's an honor to meet you, miss. I found myself blushing hard as I stared at the security pony. Sorry about shooting at you last week, the pony said, looking <clears throat> sadly, offering me his hoof. I was reaching out to shake it when his dour partner gouged sullenly. I'm not. I froze. The guard looked to his partner in dismay. But the other guard pony stood her ground. She shot those fool's parents right in front of them, she said, glaring at me, with bullets of fire. My hoof dropped back to the scrap metal floor. They call you Hellmare, you know. The guard lowered. The kids. The other guard, the buck, put a hoof over his face in embarrassment. All right, Nightbright. Let's just go. He looked at us regretfully. Sorry about that, folks. As the two guards moved away, Nightbright looked back over her shoulder and mouthed slowly, bullets of fire. Welcome to Black Sea Supplies. The black-maned indigo mare at the counter greeted us genuinely as she took in the sight of us. My name's Black Seas. I'm the mayor of this fine city and owner of this fine store. And you must be Little Pip and Calamity, she smiled. Word gets around. Thank you for stopping in. What can I do for you today? 
I looked around, feeling dazed. The small cargo ship that Black Sea Supplies has been built into had been cut apart and imported into the small or into the Pony of Friendship, then rebuilt almost completely. Metal flooring and rows of shelves had been welded onto the hold. Narrow metal stairs led up to a living quarters, which had once been the captain's cabin. An old model uh, precursor of the terminal, a combination of monitor and intercom system, was built into the wall behind a corner that looked like it had been scavenged from a diner. Calamity far fluttered forward to meet Mayor Blacksees. Pleased to meet you, he grinned. Mind if I poke around your store? I'm looking to do some trading. Well, that's a damn fine coincidence. Blacksees grinned back. That's what Black Sea Supplies is here for. After all, we got about everything you might need be need here. Here, let me show you. I watched in foggy amusement as Black Seas and Calamity dove into business. A Pegasus friend looking to unload a lot of what had scavenged from the Ministry of Image in return for bottle caps, ammo, and medical supplies, with emphasis on Rataway. Black Seas was a skilled and charismatic barter mare though, and soon had him shopping for a gift for Velvet Remedy. So I'm going to touch her heart and remind her that there were really good ponies worth fighting for. My thoughts were still drowned in the cold reminder of Arbru, leaving me detached from my surroundings and the conversation in front of me. I barely reacted when the door opened and an arsenic-colored stallion brushed by, carrying a walking stick in his muzzle. I only reacted when the stick transformed into a magical energy blaster, and he fired it at the mayor. Tarf Steph Helfo. Calamity was faster, flying into Black Seas, knocking her out of the path of the shot, and into a shelf of lunchboxes, sensor modules, and garden gnomes, which rained down upon the indigo mare. The blast of lethal magic struck a display of steam gauge assemblies, pulverizing it. My first reaction was to pull out little Macintosh, but with a start, I realized my most trusted weapon was not with me. Calamity pivoted, hooves dropping to the floor as he stood between the assassin and Black Seas. The stallion shifted to get another shot, realizing he would have to take Calamity out to get at his target. I latched off my telekinesis, lifting the arsenic-colored pony and pushing him against the far wall where two shelves blocked his view of both my friend and the mayor mare. <clears throat> I wrapped my magic around his neck, squeezing. The stallion click, kicked and flailed, his eyes bulging, the magical energy weapon dropping to the floor in a clatter. Black Seas was climbing back under her hooves, a couple garden gnomes rolling off her back as the assassin lost consciousness. I released him. The mayor blinked slowly, shaking her head. Well. Looks like your reputation as heroes is well-founded, she said, wincing slightly from a sprain. Thanks for saving my life. It's what we do, Calamity said. More for my benefit, I suspected, than hers. Why you reckon he was out to kill you? The mayor frowned. I'm pretty damn sure Raspberry Tart was behind this, she proclaimed, trotting over to the old terminal. She pressed one of the buttons underneath the monitor and barked. Tart, I need to speak to you right now. The indigo pony tapped her hoof impatiently, glancing to Calamity. Would you be a deer and tie that bastard up? Her eyes dropped to the magical energy weapon on the floor. How the hell did Lantern miss that? I stepped to where the weapon had tumbled, floating it upwards to examine it. It was a model I had never encountered before, but then I was barely knowledgeable about magical energy weapons. You might want to ask Grandpa Rattle about that, I suggested. The spell disguised the blaster as a stick. It was too similar to the old buck's magic research to be coincidence. I have a shotgun. I couldn't imagine Grandpa Rattle working with murderous ponies, though. At least, not willingly. I was suddenly fearful for the crazy old buck. The monitor flickered to life, showing the face of a grossly overweight pomegranate mare with a yellow mane and an overly charismatic smile. 
Oh, Mayor Blacksees. How good it is to hear from you. Her voice, or her words, virtually oozed out of the speaker above the monitor. And to what do I owe the honor of your call this evening? You know exactly why I'm calling, you murderous bitch. Blacksees spat, stomping her hoof. You just sent a pony to kill me. Language, she chided, her smile unfazed by the accusation. Now, now, it has hardly been a fitting, or befitting the mayor of the glorious city, to use such foul sentiment, or to go slinging around dreadful, false accusations. You deny it, then? Blacksees narrowed her eyes. Well, seeing as the would-be assassin failed, I'm sure we can put this to rest after Chief Lantern has a day or two with him in her interrogation room. Oh? The blob of a mare looked surprised. He survived, then? Good. The sooner Chief can ferret out the true culprit, the better. No? Although, it will cut into your opportunities for slander. More's the pity. I trotted up, floating the intended murder weapon in front of me. Blacksees looked at it, then to Raspberry Tart. And I don't suppose you have any idea how a weapon like this could have found its way into Friendship City. Shouldn't you be asking that to Chief Lantern? She suggested. Blacksee nickered. We both know that anything that finds its way into Friendship City beyond her back has gotten in through you. The pomegranate mayor feigned offense. Despite what you claim, mayor, the common room is not a den of smugglers and thieves. And, as the voice of those ponies, I would thank you to have more faith in them. Her words washed over my ears like slime. Besides, let's be honest. If I wanted to kill you, I would never use so crude a method. I'd poison your food. Raspberry Tart got the reaction she was looking for. Black Sea's eyes widened for a moment before narrowing again. The overweight mare virtually purred in pleasure. I was beginning to deeply and <clears throat> really dislike Raspberry Tart. Now, be a darling and keep me informed, would you, Mayor? Raspberry Tart pressured. As head of the Merchants' Union, I have a right to know about shenanigans that threaten the peace and safety of our little ponies. Of course. Mayor Blacksees grozed before cutting the conversation. The mayor's expression was cloudy. Slimy worm of a mayor. Now Chief Lantern will have to spare guards for this viper, just to make sure he doesn't have an unpleasantly life-ending accident before he can be questioned. She kicked one of the shattered garden gnomes. And I'm going to be obsessing over where I get my food. Any way we can help, I offered. The mayor raised an eyebrow. Can you get a confession? She shook her head. You already helped me more than I could ask. But, she thought a moment. If you can sneak a listening device into her office above the commons room, I may be able to catch her saying something about this mess that I can take to the council. I grinned, crossing my pit buck bonded foreleg in front of me. Sneaky is one of my specialties. My plan was simple. I'll use my stealth buck and turn invisible, slip past Raspberry Tart's guards and defenses. Even if she's in the room, I'll be able to plant the listening device and get out unnoticed. I looked down at the MG stealth buck 2, set into my pip leg. I already used it to get in and then out of Tempony Tower. The device hadn't had much time to recharge. But if it moved swiftly, and all went well, I would only need about ten minutes. I don't like the timing of this, Calamity said, <clears throat> flying over me as I pushed my way through Friendship City towards Sparkles. My innards had stopped squeezing before Life Bloom had purged me of the taint. And over the last few hours, my stomach began to rumble, reminding me that I hadn't swallowed anything other than water and rat away in days. At least half of my weakness was from starvation. You think the attack on the mayor has something to do with us? I asked. Clement had echoed my own concerns. For the attack to take place right after we walked into the store was one hell of a coincidence. And I was growing unfond of coincidences. We all know, 
Calamity admitted. Not us, particularly. Between Red Eye and the Enclave and the death of the Goddess, there's just too much going on right now for me to believe that this just happened now by chance. He let out a little growl of frustration and drooped in defeat, hanging limply from his wings. Hell, for all we know, the Hellhounds might have plotted this. Pony napping and coercion ain't exactly outside their limited vocabulary. So, this could be my fault, I moaned, staring at the floor. Add it to the list. Hey now, Clemity perked up, landing in front of me. None of this is your fault, girl. Red Eye has been plotting against the Goddess and the Enclave long since before he stepped out of the stable. He argued with confidence. He was working on ways to get into the Ministry of Awesome, and chances are he'd already found one. He did already have griffins to shut down the security systems. All you did was bump up the clock on the Enclave's arrival, and I reckon that's probably a good thing if it throws a bumper under Red Eye's wagon. I turned away, but Calamity grasped my head between his hooves and made me look at him. His wings flapped as he lifted back off the hallway. You're blaming yourself for those dead hellhounds? Maybe even steel hooves? My winds betrayed me. Well, you can just stop that nonsense right now, you hear? You got that bomb away from Red Eye, and you did to take out a genocidal threat. What do you think Red Eye would have done with it if you hadn't? He stared into my eyes, forcefully. At best, he'd have done the same himself. At worst, he'd have used it on a poly population center strong enough to stand in his way. Hell, he was already threatening Ten Pony Tower with it. I realized I was crying. Oh, damn it, Lil Pip, Clamity said, his expression softening. Come here now, let me get you something to eat. I followed him, obediently. The crowd had thinned around Sparkles. The waitress mares were looking thankful for the respite and the music on the radio had been replaced by an authoritative voice. Concluding with a monstrosity in Splendid Valley, which called herself the Goddesses. Goddess. <clears throat> the Goddess was the mother of the horrific alicorns who have been tormenting the equestrian wasteland, endangering the lives of all good ponies like yourselves. But the fiendish plot of Red Eye and the Goddess made the murders that alicorn hooves and magic pale in comparison. My face slapped into Calamity's backside as the Pegasus stopped abruptly, his ears up, listening. It was their intention to rip you from your homes and from your families, to force you to endure an agonizing, taint-driven transformation that would render you into mindless slaves. Red Eye and the Goddess have been working together not just to take your freedom or your lives, but to annihilate individuality and to devour your very souls. I stumbled back, shaking my head, then joined Calamity, wondering what the Enclave was up to. If they thought the goddess was so bad, I whispered to my friend, why did they try to ally with her? Naturally, the Grand Pegasus Enclave could not let this stand. We may have been gone for a while, but we have not forgotten our unicorn and earth pony brothers and sisters. And we were not about to allow these abominations to violate and destroy all of you. That is why we detonated a mega spell beneath the home of the goddess, the Maripony facility in Splendid Valley. My jaw dropped. The world seemed to spin out from under me. <laughs>